the story of Perth, the blacksmith, for example. He was an old man who, at the age of nearly 60, had postponedly encountered that thing in sorrows, technicals called ruin. He had been an artisan of famed excellence, with plenty to do, owned a house with a garden, embraced a daughter-like loving wife, and three blithe, ruddy children. Every Sunday, went to a cheerful-looking church planted in a grove. Now, for prudent, most wise, and economic reasons, the blacksmith's shop was in the basement of his dwelling, but with a separate entrance to it, so that always had the loving, happy wife listened not with unhappy nervousness, but with vigorous pleasure to the stout ringing of her young-armed old husband's hammer, whose reverberations passing through the walls and the floors came up to her not unsweetly in her nursery, so that to stout labor's iron lullaby, the blacksmith's infants, were rocked to slumber. But one night, under cover of darkness, and further concealed by a most cunning disguisement, a desperate burglar stole into their happy home and robbed them all of everything. And darker yet to tell. The blacksmith himself did ignorantly usher the thief into his family's heart. It was the bottle conjurer. Upon the opening of that fatal cork, forth flew the fiend that shriveled up his family's home. <sighs> oh, woe on woe. Oh, death. Why canst thou not sometimes be timely? Hadst thou come to this blacksmith ere his full ruin came upon him, then had his young widow had a delicious grief, and her orphans a truly venerable sire to dream of in their afterlife, and all a care-killing competency. But death left 
though worse than useless old man standing. Till the hideous rot of life should make him easier to harvest. But why tell the whole? The blows in the basement hammer grew more and more between, and every day each blow grew fainter than the last. The widow, the wife, the mother sat frozen in the window, her tearless eyes glitteringly gazing upon the weeping faces of her children. The bellows fell. The, cho the, 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 the forge was choked up with cinders. The house sold. The wife dived headlong into the long churchyard grass, and her children followed her thither twice. And the host houseless, familyless old man staggered off, a vagabond in mourning, his every woe unreverenced, his gray head a scorn to flaxen curls. Death seems like the only desirable sequel to a career like this. But death is only a launching into the strange untried. It is but the first salutation to the possibility of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored. So to the death-longing eyes of men such as this, who still have left in them some interior compunction against suicide, does the all-contributed and all-receptive ocean alluringly spread forth his whole unimaginable taking tears and wondrous new life adventures. And from the hearts of infinite Pacifics, the thousand mermaids sing to them, Come hither, broken-hearted. Come, here is another life without the guilt of intermediate death. Here are wonders supernatural without having to die for them. Come hither. Bury thyself in a life that to your now equally abhorred and abhorring landed world is more oblivious than death. Come hither, put up your gravestone too in the churchyard, and come hither till we marry thee. Hearkening to these voices, east and west, by early sunrise and fall of eve, the blacksmith's soul responded. And so, Perth went a wailing. I, I, a wailing go, a wailing go, a wailing go. I, I, a wailing go, I go, I go, I go. That's all I got. <laughs>
Well, that was an exciting little movie. <laughs> Thanks. Are you on? You gotta turn yourself on. There you go. Okay. All right. Hopefully. Oh, well, it's great to be Can you here. Hear me? Yeah. Okay. Blair, it's nice to see the story of Perth again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here interviewing Blair because I've watched a lot of Moby Dick work over many, many years, and um, it's always fun to talk about it. So, obviously, right? You pursue the heart of this story as Ahab pursues the white whale, that's what it seems like to those of us who watch you do it. How many, do you think, iterations have there been? I mean, even watching that movie, we can see, you know, okay, so there's this scale, there's this one. How, do you feel like, how many different times have you, how many pieces have you made? Right, right. Um, well, this is this video that you saw. It just shows uh, the work in the past four years that I've been working in workshop, meaning t times to develop the idea. In four, so there are four different times in which that's why the aesthetics change with that. And um, before that, uh, when I was at Red Moon, one of the first projects we did in, in the early '90s was to work on adaptations of Moby Dick. And uh, w the first one we did was on the beach in North Avenue with large puppets that were parade spectacle puppets and we had a little marching band and actually it was kind of like a musical. It was, there was all songs and song and, and, uh, and that was done because I thought it would be funny to perform Moby Dick on the beach. Like that just seemed like a, a fun idea. And so, um, and then we realized that it was, oh, like, or maybe I realized that I really wanted to make a full, a more full exploration of it. And so then we worked on it in several different workshops and then a, a full production that, that was produced at the Pegasus Theater in 95. And at that time, after I finished that, I felt like um, that was, um, that, that was uh, very satisfying in many ways, but that the work was not done. And I, that there was something still I wanted to understand about the book. Mm -hmm. So it really comes down to like returning to the book to try to get a, handle on the things that are uh, unexplainable about it and that are inexplicable in a way. Is this, this, it's the, the, what is made by this, what's in between all those words? Yeah, talk a little bit more about that. I mean, we just got to hear some of the words in the story of Perth. And you've, I mean, you, so you've just briefly now described, all right, so there's, there's like a, a, a parade version of Moby Dick, then there's a large scale version with puppets and objects, right? And then, I mean, in the past couple years, I've, I mean, I've seen the story of Perth probably five times that you've done in different <coughs> versions, right? There's a toy theater version. Right. So the aesthetic and the scale changes a lot. Right, right. And what, what? Wow. well, tell us quickly, when did you first encounter the book? Um, just thinking of things that would be really fun to do and <clears throat> just talking with a friend of mine, uh, Kate Gehring, an actress who used to be in Chicago, and I mm -hmm. was like, we should stage Moby Dick on the beach. It was just an idea. Like, I hadn't even read the book. I just thought, <laughs> that seems like a great so idea. So the idea came before Melville. Oh, yeah. Before. It's like, I mean, yeah. the, So the image, just the image of the, the cultural image yeah, of the, it's, it's the white like, whale. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. would I go see a puppet theater doing a, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, right? Wow. So the, the <laughs> idea is kind of the entryway. Then you encounter the words. Right, and then it's just like, it's in, and then it's just incredible what's there, right? So I, I, I've, I have ventured into a lot of projects in that kind of like mm -hmm. from the outside. Oh, it just seems like a, yeah. I would want to go see that. So why don't I make that so people can go see it? Well, yeah. it makes sense in a way, right? It's you're a puppeteer, you're an image artist. And so it's like the image first. Right. And then you get into the words and the story and figure out what that is. Or right. I mean, that makes a certain sense to me. Right, right, right. What is this inexplicable thing? The, uh, what it, you said you will return to it. To right. What is unexplainable yeah, it's, about um, the novel? Well, it's funny because the book has the layers of it's, it's, a, it's an adventure story. You know, you can just follow this. And then it's got all this stuff in between, which it, all this, 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 it's philosophical and it's, it's a meditative and it's, it's, it, it encompasses the whole world and literally and, and figuratively. And, and uh, so that, the, that 
that a very simple adventure story of going out to kill a whale in kind of an action-packed way can also have this other element to it is, is really just is, is thrilling. And, um, um, and there's stories within stories of the book. There's like, several, like the story of Perth, and then there's the, the story of the Jeroboam, this, this whole boat that's got this problem with this, uh, this uh, self-appointed prophet who's leading the ship, and the captain is no longer, has been mutinied. And, and, uh, uh, and then the, uh, the story of Steel Kilt in the, in the, in, and um, there's countless little tales within tales that are, that th within themselves are fascinating, like this one of Perth. And, and that to me is, I, I love that element of it too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I worry because we're working on this thing and I have to say, the piece is so big, it, it, the book is so big, and I, there's so many things I'm interested in about it. And, and this is, on, on the page, this is two pages of our script, and our script is like 80 pages long. It's like, this two pages that just took eight minutes, I'm like, <laughs> but you, okay, how what's reasonable to do, and so th that's one of the that's one of the challenges. And so, okay, first of all, in adaptation, you, it's just absurd to try to take on, you can't take on the whole. It's like a biography; you can't take on something. It's find something small and within it and work on that. And so that that's you know um, that that's kind of an exciting thing for me to return to a piece of material and just say, okay, what what I'm now a mid career artist. I'm 51 years old, I'm, this is, you know, 20 years have passed, and I'm looking at this material differently, and I'm thinking differently about it, and I'm connecting to something different about it. And, and, and it's still relevant to me, so that's. Can you speak to that? So going back now, you say you're connecting to something different about it. Do you know what that is, emotionally or psychologically, yeah, it's, recently? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's funny, because the whole, there's the obvious story of Ahab and obsession and, 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 and trying and this kind of thing that, that initially is very powerful in the story, I connect, connected to it powerfully. Now I'm really interested in the this, this spiritual quest of the story, that the, there is a whole kind of structure of the book that is like a, a third testament to the, to the uh, Judeo-Christian Bibles, and that, this, uh, uh, and that it's constructed in relationship to the, the emergence of, of a, this new country, the United States, and, 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 and metaphor, and, and this notion of that, that, that religious freedom and independence was so powerfully part of our founding of our country and continues to be like, we are a, a, a more religious society than the rest of the first world peoples, and, and that's a fascinating thing to me. It's just, it is evident within our fabric. It's constantly in our dialogue, uh, as an underpinning, it's, and I think at the same time, it's in this book, like all the, the, the a, uh, Melville took these secondary characters in the Old Testament and, and brought them into his story, but they, they bring with them their, their, their experience in the Old Testament. So Ahab was a, 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 you know, a king who, who had a, a, a complicated relationship to, to God and, and had had uh, uh, um, gone against the Jewish people in a variety of different ways and, and was a blasphemer in the same way as Ishmael is this, uh, we have looked at Ishmael as, as, as even though he is the first son of, of, of uh, uh, Abraham, he's, he is cast off into the wilderness and his, we consider him not to be a part of the Judeo-Christian culture and and instead he becomes a prophet for the Muslim religion and that becomes, so that's, it's just a totally fascinating thing that these characters are the characters who are in this story and, and those strains are really powerful and strong. And so I'm like, how can that come, like how can, how, you know, it's almost like the, the, there is a, there's a, the storytelling is, is, is trying to, to, uh, uh, Heal this, heal something in 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 its act of being told, and I think I think Melville himself experienced that in writing. But I also think it eventually became to have that. It came to have a prominence in our literary history, just like that. It speaks to us and 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 our us as a peoples. And I think that that is something that that I I just I have a, a strong connection to. Is I, I um, I'm hoping that by putting some of it on stage. Like taking, like just the, 
like even to capture like, oh, like um, if there's, there's a, some, you know, this Perth section, th there's several times where it's a single sentence I'm saying mm -hmm. that goes on for, it's a paragraph mm -hmm. in the book, but it's a single sentence, a single idea, and there's a 12 or 14 images that all stand on their own in that one sentence, and then now I'm layering other images on top of it. So like how can I create something that doesn't step on Melville's images, but actually takes us into the, the images more uh, in some sort of way. Like the discovery of like, oh, just the Perth is revealed, like the family is revealed, the, 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 the thief is announced that he's come into the home. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a one quarter of the sentence. And then I pause there and let just, a, you know, just the shadow play try to understand like what kind of terror, fear are really plays out in that when, when someone's home is ruined by a thief. And this, whole, and this beautifully rendered, because it's a, it's a thief, as if he's broken in the basement window and clock. But it, it's alcoholism. It's, it's, a, it's an addiction. It's something that's destroying internally this man. And, and that's just such a power. I mean, if you, you guys know this, this chapter. It's like there's this one paragraph that this is, there's a whole world in there. And so like, how can, how can more of a, how can that be illuminated in the theater? Like, the, how can the theater be a place where that can be illuminated so there can be a collective experience of, of wit? Because that's what theater is. We have you sit in the audience, and you have a collective experience in there, and that can be there can be something with that. You know, there's a there, that can be an answer in some sort of way. Wow. So you're talking about th this image is really powerful to me. This this there's a tiny world within a paragraph on one page of many many pages of this story. <laughs> And you know that's what you do. You make tiny worlds, right? So you're talking about entering, entering this miniature world, creating this miniature world of this paragraph, so that you can then enter it, and find out what's going on in there. Right. It's very beautiful. Right. Right. Um, often, I think I, I've worked with a lot of adaptations too on stage, and I think sometimes it feels like, an, I mean, there are wonderful adaptations of novels, right? But it feels like you're kind of um, you walk into a garden when you do an adaptation. So there's this whole garden, and then you know, you only have two hours on the stage, so you like pick some flowers, pick the high points, and then you mm. stick them in a vase, and then like, right. then you show that to the audience. Yeah. And um, there's this whole garden of <laughs> all the other things that are the, the words in the book and everything. And I always feel like, well, you know, we're not burning the book. People like the adaptation, they can go read the book. Um, but the way you describe it and the way you're thought, it's like, it go it's like you're returning to that garden again and again. And the more it seems like this conversation with Melville over your lifetime mm -hmm. and creating and entering these different paragraphs. I'm curious if you could tell us what are some of the things you found in that conversation. So even if there are mo moments that are like, okay, that one was satisfying. That was satisfying. This thing we made was satisfying. Um, there's so many I have from watching the work, but yeah, like yeah. which things have you seen that mm -hmm. you've made where you're like, right, 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 uh, right. yes, Got okay, something. good. Right, 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 right. Huh, well, let's see. Um, Just uh, a, even, even e small ones. Yeah, 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 I hear you. Um, um, in one of the shadow things that we did, there was this, I, I, I tried to uh, take the, the last paragraph that got cut off in the, in the first publication of it in, in England, of the book with the epilogue that you all know, in, in where he basically says, and I alone survived to tell thee. Um, this, and he, he's, uh, he's describing the, um, the, the coffin, Queequeg's coffin rising up. In, in a, and you know, you, you could very clear image of, you know, it would come up out of the surface of the water and do this. And so I thought, okay, well, before that happened, there's de debris going down. And so making a shadow image of essentially you're seeing floats and jets some sinking to the bottom, you're seeing drowned sailors sinking to the, you know, people and stuff in the broken ship cleaved in two coming down. And then from that, so it's like a shadow play. So we got to play things moving down from the screen. And then the, the coffin starts to come up. And the coffin's coming up. And now you're kind of, the coffin is actually, actually just sitting in the screen going like this. And things are passing by it. And it's rising up. And then it comes up. And so this is a moment that's not in the book. But it's mm -hmm. a moment that, that captures uh, something about, about just like what actually happened at that juncture in the story. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
Well, okay, that's just one example, right? I don't know. You're going <laughs> to go through the whole list of them. <laughs> <laughs> there are but, many, many. You know, whether we performed it really well, that's a whole other thing. And like, should I have built another puppet that broke in half so when this ship hit the bottom? You know, all those kinds of technical things. There's like, how to achieve that. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And there was another moment, it was very briefly in the video you saw where, where I'm banging yeah. on the floor. Do you see this thing? Oh, I love and that then I, And then I pull up a, a, it, what it is is a drowned sailor. This notion of that, that Ishmael, who one can only imagine is in, if he has, if he's a character who continues after the story and has to live the rest of his life having had this experience, uh, <laughs> like how do you adjust back to, I mean, how would you adjust? If, it, 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 so he's in a, he's, he would be constantly with the ghost of those stories in, in, the, yeah. in the rhyme of the ancient mariner kind of way. He would be haunted with them for the rest of his life. And so the notion that they're, they're literally swimming under his flo floorboards, you know, they're, they're the drowned carcasses of his, of his fellow sailors from the Pequod. That, you know, that, um, yeah, that one was a, a small room, as I remember it, an entirely white, very small room on a stage, and then underneath the floor and in the walls were the drowned sailors right, right. Yeah. with the water. Right. Yeah, many images of haunting through it. Okay, so the whale. Right. Right, so you do this story, right? Any kind, you're searching for whale, 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 looking, talking about whale, right? And then, and then as the artist, especially as an artist who works with objects and spectacle, you have to produce the whale, kind of, right? Yeah, I, this is What's what I would like? say yes, I would say yes. <laughs> like I would be, if I went to, if I went to see a puppet show as Moby Dick and the whale wasn't there, I would be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you know, the, they made an opera recently of, the, of Moby Dick and they don't have a whale at the end. They don't have a, this, you know, it's an opera, okay, well, whatever, they will suggest the whale and this kind of, you know, or you know, you do a stage version, the whale doesn't appear because it doesn't make sense the way the whole thing had been playing out, da 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 da. Here we have a vocabulary where that is possible. And so um, that's, uh, you saw a few clips of, we, uh, a year ago, I guess it was, we were at the uh, residence at the University of Chicago. We just said, okay, I was just like, okay, let's stage the last three, those chapters that chase day one and two and three. Let's make it happen. Um, and, um, uh, well, you, you, the, you could see a couple images of it. I have to say, when we were done with it, we were like, ah, that, you know, the whale's cool. It was, there was kind of this great technical thing about how we could make it move up and down pretty quickly in a way that doesn't always happen, et cetera. But at the same time, it was, it was just, the, we, we later got a bunch of pieces of paper, like actually that stuff right there, we had chunks of it, and we were just like mm. waving it around in the air like this, and it was like, that's actually a more better whale than that whale we made. <laughs> and so it's just like that whale we made is, the, okay, it's clearly a whale. I see his jaw. There, I get it. You know, they're swimming around, but there's no, it doesn't have, it didn't have power in a way. Like, so my critique of that would be looking like, yeah, it's, it, it, there's a, com it is a problem when it starts becoming so concrete when it, that you literally show it all, then you, and, and is there some sort of way that you can, uh, you know, and this is where like, can I do that? Where I show, where I create the fear and the danger in the presence of the whale without having to make a, a an actual illustrative image of the whale. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, there, but not there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we, we we feel it's you know we we have to see that fight and the tension and all that stuff you know for. Um, anyway, that's sort of where I'm at right now with it. Um, have you in all the versions of it? Have you made? Oh, uh, is there a moment of the whale you really like? I mean, you talked about the the crumpled paper just recently. Yeah, the one that we did with Red Moon, one thing that was really fun, when, uh, there's a great moment where uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in the, this, I think the second day of the chase, Ahab's in, the, in, the, in his, his boat and he's got his harpoon and he's, the, the Moby Dick is there, he's somewhere underwater, they don't know where he is and they're looking for him and there's just this moment where Moby Dick comes up under his boat and just like parks himself right there and Ahab is looking down the water and Moby Dick is kind of looking up at him and he's got his harpoon and he can't, he's not gonna strike down, Moby Dick is not gonna strike down. It's, there's this tension, right? This, where they almost just like are facing off. And so that we, we did that thing with the chair. Do you remember this moment? In, not well the, enough, keep talking. We, so uh, uh, Jim Lasko was the director and we came up with this idea, I was playing Ahab and so I was in this chair. We had these four ropes that went off to yeah. the wings in the chair and so 
um, the, and the ropes kind of created a water line. And, um, and the, they, I, could, I could be in the chair and they could start pulling me around like the, I could get moved around. So there are puppeteers off stage, and the ropes were evident, big kind of husky ropes. You know. And then I, um, uh, and I've got the harpoon and it's like, and it's kind of out of control. And then I'm tossed out of the, the chair, the throws me as an actor out. And then I'm trying to get back into the chair and the chair just starts to go up and down. The actors are just wailing on the rope and the chair is going up and down. I'm trying to catch the chair and it smashes on the ground, smashes and yeah. Yeah. breaks apart and tears in pieces like, like a stove boat. And it's like, how do you create? So it was a stove chair is what it was. <laughs> but it had, a, uh, I always felt it had, I was in it, so like, how can you really be, be sure? No, 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 But yeah. anyway, I felt like that was something where like, how do you, how do you put something in the, in the theater that's going to have that That, that ferocity, yeah. yeah. But what's so interesting about that as a, you know, a, as a puppeteer is that, so there's no whale in that moment, right? It's the action. Right. It's right. the feeling, it's not the object. Right, right. You know, and after, like, okay, is it this object? Is it that? There was also a fantastic whale, real, whale, in, whale puppet in that right, production right. that it's really true. was as big as the Pegasus stage, and it was like a skeleton. Um, so that it was very satisfying to see that. But you're right that, I mean, so it's like the absence of the creature mm -hmm. is the thing. Do you think that's true of the novel? Is it the absence of the creature? <clears throat> well, the it, negative it, space that it leaves behind uh, that he's chasing? It, well, this is, uh, you know, this is an. Uh, for me, yes, of course. You spend the whole book and not seeing this not character. Not seeing it. And he's spending all this time describing this character, and and he and uh, and painstakingly, we are all slog through the painstaking details of the whale. But the the thing that is so intriguing to me about it is is he 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 says, well, you know, I can't really. It's undescribable what I'm talking about because if we pull the whale out and we look at it. On you know, dead right. on the beach or up on the boat or whatever it is, and it, it's no, it's not the whale because yeah. it, it's dead. It's not the whale. But if it's in the water swimming around, you can't see it because it's in the water swimming around. And you know, of course, it breaches and you can see it there. And there's but there's this thing about it. it's what I'm describing to you. Can't I can't describe. And so I'll tell you this and I'll tell you this way and I'll tell you this way. And oh, here's this great story here that's kind of about it too. And, and it's just he keeps building around the whole thing. Uh -huh. And so you know, I. Because that actually, and then of course in the end it, it does appear in its ferocity. And, but um, uh, yeah, and so that becomes for sure a parallel to my own experience as, a, as an art maker trying to yeah. constantly get around and, and um, you know. Uh, but also it says a lot about puppetry too, about what, you know, what you're trying to make the objects do, what you're trying to make the objects into. Right. Because in a way, this moment you describe, and the, even the white papers, just like the suggestions and the things, they have to be enough. Like you said, the opera, it's not like, okay, well, we didn't see it. You have to feel like you saw it without right. it actually being a thing. Right. This is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, and and uh, that happens a lot in the puppet theater. I mean, the, it's the famous, most famously is the puppet's face, is that people yeah. say, oh, you, you made the eyes move, or the mouth move. And I was like, no, no, we didn't do that. Yeah. But it, it, in truth, you know, in, in the, the, the practices of the Bunraku, the doll puppet tradition of Japan, the, the manipulators it, it would say there are, there are five or six expressions on this puppet's face, and it has to do with like how the angle of the head is held that create the expression, but the, the face doesn't change at all. And so that, there's a technique in manipulation that has to do with making the audience see something that's not there, mm. you know, that is the connection of, of puppetry to, to magic in that way, like that we're going to, the, there's going to be an illusion here. And, um, and, but for the puppet maker, there's the challenge that you're, you're going you're gonna to fabricate the thing. You're going to make the thing, but you don't want to make it too much, because if you make it too much, then there's no, there's nothing, there's no space in between I, 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 how to, Describe that. It's sort of like if the picture is to complete, the audience doesn't have anything to do. There's not, it's, mm. it's kind of like the, the amazing CGI work of film today is, is becomes, a, one of my students described as generous. I'm like, well, that's a good <laughs> way to think about it. It's, the audience does, have to, does less and less work and sit back more and more and be mm. less imaginative because there's so much imagination going on. So the theater is a place where you, mm -hmm. you, you want to uh, provoke the imagination of the audience, yeah. right? So you want to 
suggest, and you know, so like the, the whole notion of the shadow is one thing. Like to me, it's like there's, the shadow is the an amazing tool in the puppet theater because it's what you're watching is not it doesn't really, it doesn't exist. It's an ephemeral thing, the shadow. Mm -hmm. and, and when it starts to move, like these things, the, the, I simply move the light across the, and, you, and the, they move in a way that they don't move in the cinema and they don't move normally in life. And so they're, they seem to move from another source of, mm -hmm. of power in some sort of way. And that, that's compelling, you know, that, 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 that draws you into to the, and they can, they can reveal things that are non-pedestrian because of that, right? Wow, so you said at the beginning of our conversation, so you keep going back to Melville's novel for what's um, unexplainable in it, for what's, mm -hmm. you said, what's between all those words. Mm -hmm. And then it sounds like, so we're sort of talking about the theater as you know, not a completely finished image, but that the audience is always, there's always something unexplainable happening, right? There's something between the event that's happening that you need the audience's imagination. Right. And so it's really a whole story about suggestion. So it starts to feel like, in a way, Moby Dick is such a way of understanding what is fascinating about the theater, why we go back to it as audience, why we go back to it as theater makers. That's really interesting. Um, I could say more about that. Here, we want to, you know what we should do is just in a moment, let's take some questions from the audience. So if anybody has questions for Blair, what you're going to do is come down to these microphones right here. And let's start with just, you know, just a couple people, if you have something to say, come, you can make your way down. And while people are thinking about that and doing that, so can you grab any images from the book that you've never done, that you've never put your hand on yet, that you're, that, but you can imagine? That I can imagine that you doing? can imagine, like how you've never done it. I've always wanted you to do this. I've said, <laughs> I've said Blair, I want to come see the show where like, you just get a mic and you just like you, and then you just talk about the Moby Dick you imagine in your head. Um. Yeah. There was one with Fadala yeah, yeah. and the well, frame. Oh, I right? forget that one. Fidala oh, frame. well, that was an old one. Okay. <laughs> well, I do, the, the one that I do is the, the, the idea of the souls, like mm -hmm. the being that the, that the characters, that the, the crew has a soul that they carry with them in some sort of way. And I've just had this image of a box on the performer's chest that, ca that was like a place where it was a, it ultimately was, was really just like a silhouette made out of a silky white fabric, you know, image, and that, uh, that th their drowning is depicted by the, um, the boxes popping open and the souls pull being pulled out, and that the actors themselves are descending back while the, the puppet is manipulated to ascend in a, either a drowning way or, a, you know, an image of death, you know, that... That's beautiful. That's an old one I could really like to do something with somehow. Um, you know, it's, uh, let's see, I don't know. Come up with more images than the ones I've already come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you talking about the proscenium arch, that, like in a theater with a proscenium arch, this huge arch, and that the arch would fall. That the whale, the tail of the whale, we'd only see the tail, and that the arch would fall in a way, like seem like it was going to fall into the audience and then fall back. Right, right, right. I had that, like, that, that would be a there, good one, there was right? that image, cool. and the other image of like uh, the uh, I had somehow the, the idea that Ishmael is, is thrown yeah. into the audience, yeah. like that the actor at the beginning of the story is like literally like it's like a and he's but then that he he has a rope attached to him and so he's caught and ends up back up on the stage and so I'm trying to figure out how to catapult an actor off the stage. <laughs> with a rig on him so that he wouldn't, he would look like he's falling, but then he would come back. And another one of like having him in a room and like that he's in the room and that the room in, we feel like it's his room and he's living in it and he's thinking of the, all the past experience. And then the, the, uh, 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 when he actually starts to experience the whale, that the room is really a tilt table mm. and that, it, that it, the whole room starts to tilt back and forth and that he's, like it's a boat that he can't stay on and that he's being washed off of. Um, another one would be nice one to, to do this thing where uh, they're almost all my things are like, how do you do it technically? Like, how do you actually do it? It's not, not like a filmic cinematic image. It's like the notion of like creating a, 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 a floating drowned man. Like, how can you create that illusion? And w with the notion of a, like a, a teeter board that has a 
plank that an actor can lie on and that another actor can use a counterweight to like make it just move up and down slightly. And then if it goes back further into a dark area, there, it could look, you could create the, through lighting the image of just a floating <coughs> body on the stage. And so, you know, that kind of. So you can actually get the presence of the, like the, the challenge of the, the whale is a challenge, but the ocean is also mm -hmm. a challenge. Like mm -hmm. the ocean is, mm -hmm. it's all, the, the ocean is constant and the ocean is, is, is so revealing in so many ways. So how can you create somehow that experience of that vastness and of, that, and the, of the unknown, of the terror, but also of the, the, the absolute lovely lushness of the moments where like when he's meditating and he's, just daydreaming, I guess, and he's sitting up in the in the crow's nest, and the and the and the and the boat just kind of does this tilting kind of thing, and 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 the experience of that, like you're up there for hours, and 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 like how can you get some feeling of that happen in the in the theater? Like how can there be that 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 liberty and that freedom and that and that 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 Melville's talking about, and even. That he's saying Perth is being lured by this, this mm. like this. This is more oblivious than death. Like that's like when you're when you're you, when you have a, a ruin like life like Perth, or or you you have a despair that drives you to be a, a sailor. Like if you have that, like you want you don't necessarily want death. You want something that's that's like a, an escape from that, but it's a different life, and that and that's what. Like all those men share that experience, and, and so and why are they you know, there for that? And so I want to get the feeling of that in the space, like for that. And so like you got a little bitty stage, like just a stage. Like how can that how can that happen? What objects do we need in spatial? For the oceans? vastness of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Which is still actually so unexplored, right? What is that that we know? We know yeah. only a very very small percent of the ocean, even in reality. Any questions for Blair? Sure. Yeah, come on down, join us. <laughs> uh, your uh, recent thing about the ocean being this great thing of terror. Mm -hmm. Have you ever worked with the, the figure of Pip, with a, which I think is amazing. Oh, yeah. It's like two sentences where the, oh. the uh, ocean buoys up his finite body and drowns his infinite soul. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. I was just curious if you've worked with that. And Yes, in fact, that, that's one image that in 95 we, we came up with some great things that his it's he said the, the soul pit uh, doesn't drown, but he's floating on the surface and his soul descends down and he sees the foot of God on the loom of the world weaving the web and woof and, and, and because of that they call him mad. And so that, but then he had sends, so this notion of like, so he had created a doll that, that suspended up high and using a piece of plastic to create this image of, a, of another part of the doll coming down below. That was w one way to try to do that. And then he, it's amazing because he almost comes Old Testament, right? And he's trying oh, yeah, to yeah. understand the Shakespearean yes. wise man. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, Pip is astounding. Good afternoon, a wonderful performance. And I had seen some advertising of your company. And so when I saw the listing here for the uh, uh, Humanities Festival, I said, well, Puppets. I don't know if I'm interested in puppets, but I'm an actor and I would be interested in what you're doing. The last rem, uh, thing I remember is you doing a show about an explosion. And I thought, on West Hubbard, they're doing a show about a single event, an explosion? Who is this guy? <laughs> and we can see by your conversation and your mm -hmm. success here, you have talent coming out of your toes, and we've seen it here this morning. <laughs> uh, the one thing that would make it even better if the library would supply captions or a sign language person so we could enjoy every single word that's said here. I'm a member of the hearing loss community mm -hmm. okay. and I need your support for this building to have captions or sign language for our listeners. Uh, it's just a fantastic program. How do you recruit your people? Are, are they basically puppeteers or are they actors or are they actors or dancers? Or tell us a little bit about the background of your unusual group and how would you draw an audience other than children to see puppets? That's right. my question. Okay, uh, great. Uh, well, I, I, I teach at the School of the Art Institute and so I can round people up that way. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, people sometimes come and say they would like to work with me if they've seen something I've done, and then, and then I ask people, I say, Jessica, do you know someone who can help me do something? <laughs> um, and sometimes I have auditions. 
and I've had auditions. So, you know, those kinds of things. But uh, yes, uh, I think more to the question, the answer to the question is, is the artist who works in the puppet theater it has a variety of different skills they bring. And so some of them are great performers, but, but also intuitively understand objects, and, and, and that works. And some uh, are not necessarily great performers, but they uh, understand objects and can build them. And so there's, because there's, someone has to come up with a solution to make the puppet too. It's, a puppet can't just be a piece of wood. It's got to, it's got to have something to it, and there's a, that's a whole alchemy in itself, you know. And so, um, you know, what actually is a puppet artist? For a long time, I thought they need to be a consummate in so many ways, but not really. No, they, they need to, but they do need to be able to have, uh, they don't necessarily need to be actors. So musicians are also good, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in, um, do, you, do you have like a, a personal connection to a specific character in the story? Has that like changed with different iterations? Of the story that you've done, mm -hmm. and since your answer may be kind of like, well, all of the above or whatever, mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about any personal connection you have to the to the way, to the character of the way? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, I really liked uh, Queequeg a lot, and I've always uh, and, and Ishmael, I like him too. I like the school teacher guy, um, uh, and. Um, those have been my, those have been my consistently favorite characters, um, and uh, um, uh, and um, the uh, the cook who delivers such a wonderful speech to the sharks about how they need to look out for each other and not be stealing from their. I like the cook character a great deal, <laughs> um, and I also like uh, uh, Bell. Pay League and Bill Dead. Uh, no, I'm just talking about the parts I like in the book. <laughs> but anyway, um, and th in terms of the whale, you know, I don't have any, like, I don't think of the whale as being a, a character. I don't think of, like, that the whale is, is, it's almost like the, I don't really, he doesn't, I don't think of him have, as having a will and a, you know, I don't anthropomorphize him or something. I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, something else to me less than a character and something greater than that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question? Over here. here. Uh, yes, uh, about the whale. Um, were you able to attend the recent Field Museum show on whales where they had those, like, those giant skeletons and all that other stuff? And um, uh, did it... Uh, you know, well, what did you think of it, and did it uh, have any impact on your visions for the whale itself? Uh, I have to say, no, I did, was, did not. I was not able to see that show. So, um, yeah, I didn't maybe, see it. Maybe we can extend that question just a little bit so, um, to, because the thing about that is how the, the reality of a whale, the realness of a whale. Oh, I see. Hmm. Sounds like sometimes, sometimes not. Yes, it's yeah. Of course, it's I'm, I'm fascinated. Trying to get both. Yeah, it's, it's it's like doing the research. You want to see what the it actually looks like and how mm -hmm. it moves and images in that kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. um, I haven't been working. I mean, we made that one big whale, but I haven't been working on the whale so much. I have to say. Yeah, one of my very favorites was in the Red Moon one. When at the very very beginning of the show, it was the first image. The narrator said, "This is right. a story of a man and a whale. Little man, little whale, and the whale wins." And so you were, the whale was demystified from the very first moment. Right, right, right. And it was so small, but then right. you felt like you'd seen it. Go ahead. Uh, the growing sensation that I echo here, here, and I'm not aware of it, but is there a seminal work on Moby Dick in gender studies? Is this such a male man's story? And as a, in, in theater arts and an audience concerns, how do you, how, how, how do you handle that within your own reading? Mm -hmm. uh, does it mean anything? But it just occurred to me when I saw the men lining up here <laughs> to speak. And right. I do like the story, but I don't know about any. Um, I have not thought of the most critical studies. Right, right. It's a real man's story. E e yeah, there's hardly any w women who, at all in the story, for sure. And, um, and I'm not a scholar, so I'm not going to be able to speak to the gender studies issue about it. Uh, um, um, but my own response is, you know, uh, I, I, 
you know, it's, I, I'm a w white, m educated male, and so I, 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 I gravitate, you know, towards this story because I feel like it's a story about me. Like, and so mm -hmm. that's what, yeah. <laughs> and that's wow. great. So, I, you know, in terms of that, it's, uh, um, uh, I guess that's the best thing I could say about it. Um, it's interesting because also, um, uh, David Catlin at The Looking Glass is also working on an adaptation of this book, and we would, had worked together on our uh, residency at the University of Chicago, and um, uh, he's, he's interested in, in, in bringing the, there's the, the fates that Ishmael talks about at the beginning, how the fates gave me this lousy part of a, you know, a whaling voyage, you know, when other people had magnificent parts and high trauma, Tra tragedies and comedies and stuff, and, and this notion of the fates being these characters who are that are that are almost like uh, you know that are hovering in the story and, and and governing the story in some sort of way and, and being female is is something that's kind of interesting and powerful. But hmm. I mean, even in the little piece you did, right? There's Perth's wife. There's oh, right. so much descriptive stuff about her, and then there are the mermaids, the mermaids singing the oh, like the yeah, ocean, yeah, yeah. and then the mermaids. book is feminine. I mean, I, I mean the, bo the boat, the boat is mm -hmm. is feminine. So there, it's very strange, it's a strange, strange gender threads that go through it. Right. Anybody else? One yes, more question? Yeah, yeah, come on. I'm curious. You were talking earlier when you talked about the book about how there's this adventure story and then all of these other intermittent parts. Have you ever done? A performance about the cytology chapters, about the structure of the whale and the image of the whale. Um, uh, no, I have not done. I have not uh, tackled those chapters. Um, uh, the, I've had some images from them because they're, you know, they're they're so graphic and they they render these descriptions of these whales, some of which are historically not accurate, but others of which are accurate and and um, and. and there was a, t a time where I wanted to somehow, like, how can we get the kind of uh, swimming in these images that, that, are, that, are, uh, that are old and historical in some sort of way onto the stage? Um, that's about as far as I got with that. <laughs> <laughs> one more Great, okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, I see that the novel Ahab's Wife. Can you use the other microphones? Oh, that's what I was No problem. Okay. All right. Have you read the novel Ahab's Wife? No, I have not read this novel. But... I do know like the premise of it. It's like from yes. Ahab's wife's perspective. Yes, I've heard about. So the premise. I was just wondering if you were interested in doing like a like a spin off of that, like with the perspective of a woman. The, uh, I myself would probably not do that, <laughs> but uh, uh, I I find that a very fascinating thing, and it's on the the list of interest to me. But there, I have to say, there's all these books on on the Bible in and Ahab and Moby Dick that are right now on my top list. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Hello. Hello. I read something that you said, and I'm paraphrasing, that so far the sort of spirit of the book has eluded you in performance. And mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit about that and what, what portion of the, I guess, um, novel has eluded you. Wow. What has gotten away? What part of the book has slipped away? Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, I think um, uh, I, I think just the, the, the presence of, of the crew at large, like the, uh, like a whole, like just the, the mass of the men. Like I've been able to start mm -hmm. focusing on like these, really it's almost like a two character show. Like here's Starbuck and Ahab talking. Now here's Ishmael and Queequeg talking. Now, you know, it's just like, here's Perth talking to his wife. It's just like, it's, it's kind of this thing of these, these smaller, whereas this, this whole thing of like this, this group of men that are doing this thing and, and also the mindset of that they all, they all have, they all become obsessed. They all share the obsession, and 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 it becomes their story too, and just actually have the presence of that. Mm -hmm. And that maybe it's just a casting thing. So you get, but is you know in the puppet theater, like the Bun Raku dolls you see I'm working mm -hmm. with, you I've got to have two at least two maybe three people on each puppet. So that's you got six people for two people to have a conversation. So if you have like three, you got nine people, then you got twelve. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> 
So Your there's that focus. challenge. There's that challenge with the, the puppet theater. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, so much for yeah. coming. Thank you, Blair, for sharing your passion.